fortunes of the Gordon Black Company began to rise in 1991, and it appears to be no coincidence to us that it was because of the arrival of Teddy Black. Uh, his background is in psychology as well as statistics. He works in a variety of uh, their marketing research work, and I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about that as he this morning talks about a particular case study uh, that he um, would, would like to, to discuss with us so that we can better get a feel for how statistics is used, how it will be used. So, without further ado, I give you one of Rochester's best kept secrets, David Bach. <laughs> I'll be with you in a minute. Technology isn't always faster. <laughs> Not yet. Well, it's working so far. But I was uh, giving a presentation last Friday at a. Uh, I'll take. I'll leave it here. At a symposium of. Uh, people from different companies on customer loyalty and my computer blanked out halfway through the presentation. So this, um, this morning I have my multi-thousand dollar technology and my thirty dollars worth of overheads to back up. <laughs> uh, I learned uh, statistics primarily from psychologists uh, um, in graduate school and undergraduate school and if I looked back 25 years ago and said, what am I going to be doing? I would have said, well, I'm going to be sitting around generating psychological theory and helping graduate students design experiments and things like that. And um, I do maybe a little bit of that kind of thinking, but I do a lot more of very mundane, practical stuff to answer questions that people pay me to give the answers to. And there are two skills that I acquired without much thought along the way that have really I attribute to uh, my success or being where I am. And the first is touch typing. <laughs> and the second is whatever I learned along the way about statistics that enabled me to learn more whenever I encountered a problem. And I've pretty much learned about 70% of what I know because I had a problem that needed to be solved. I didn't learn it in the classroom. But what I learned in the classroom helped me know where to look. And it's surprising what I did learn in the classroom that I have forgotten and then something comes up and I'm able to apply it. So I have a, people who work with me, and one of them was dealing with a particular problem, and I said, oh yeah, that's Fisher's exact test. And I don't know where that came from, because I had never applied Fisher's exact test since my non-parametric statistics course. But I remembered it, it came out of memory from someplace. Uh, one thing that's different about um, sort of learning statistics from me in the classroom and actually applying it on the job is that um, the data sets that you work with in the classroom, the problems and things, uh, you sort of don't worry about where they came from. You know, they have sometimes computer gen or randomly generated distributions or distributions that came from other sources and you just say, here's a set of numbers, go and apply the rules or s answer this question with respect to this set of data. Well, getting the data is uh, sometimes 90% of what survey research is about and what the statistics is about because without understanding how we get the data in the first place, uh, people in my profession can often end up misapplying statistical tools. And statistics for me really is a tool. It's nothing else but a way to help me deliver what I deliver to my clients. It's not an end in itself. Uh, just an overview of my presentation. I'm going to talk primarily about sampling in survey research issues around how we get the, not the data that we use for our statistical analysis. So what's the basic problem that we face with respect to sampling? What are some typical survey sampling applications? I am going to talk about a case example, a real life example of sampling. 
And then a little bit about complex survey samples and weighting. What we do in, sort of in, in many of the circumstances we encounter that are not straightforward. <coughs> so it's easy to talk about random sampling and give examples of drawing random samples, but in the real world, dealing with healthcare data, dealing with public policy data, dealing with market research data, it usually is not so clean. The basic sampling problem, imagine a jar filled with marbles. There are different color marbles. There are red marbles, black marbles, green and white. And these are the proportions in the jar. So I laboriously counted out the marbles ahead of time and put them in the jar in these proportions. A basic sampling problem for research is how can we estimate or verify the proportions with a sample of marbles rather than counting them all. Now, Imagine 100 marbles. Well, it's not that much of a task to dump all the marbles out in some place that they won't roll away and count them. But if we're beginning to talk about Monroe County and who's going to vote for whom for the next um, county executive election, and there are a few hundred thousand voters in Monroe County, then it's a lot more difficult to poll each one of those voters prior to election day and say, who are you most likely to vote for when the election comes around? So sampling becomes a practical issue for almost all of social science research. Occasionally we have clients that have 100 customers and will attempt to contact and get information and data from all of those customers. But in most cases, we're dealing in uh, populations that are in the hundreds of thousands or millions or hundreds of millions if we talk about households across the nation. So the problem that we're trying to address with respect to sampling is how do we take some subset of that population of 100 million households and estimate or verify some distribution of some variable in that population. So the considerations are how big should the sample be and what method should we use to withdraw the marbles in this case. And how big should the sample be has lots and lots of implications for uh, practical social research. There's a, um, we hire people who have some quantitative background to do our project work. And we have a little quiz that we often administer in the course of an interview. And we ask the prospective candidates, most of whom come from master's programs where they've had some statistics. It might be an MBA program or a public policy program or a psych or social program. And we ask them to imagine a scenario where they're going to be the consultant. And my problem is I want to estimate the market share for my product. And you, as a consultant, need to ask me four questions in order to determine the sample size. And what are those four questions? And I'm going to talk a little bit about what those four questions are. But one question that we hope that the person will ask us is, how big is your budget? <laughs> <laughs> because there is no sampling problem that enough money and enough observations cannot solve. But seldom does the funding entity have that kind of money. I worked for AT&T for um, several years. And one of the first major surveys I did um, with respect to sample size, the internal person at AT&T had a particular requirement and was willing to pay $100,000 to do 6,000 interviews. Um, I'm going to spend the next several uh, minutes talking about how we approach you know, what's behind the sample size. And some of this may be completely familiar to you. It's usually not that well understood by our clients. The first consideration that we deal with is sampling error. There's always, or it's, there's a certain probability anyway, that whatever we pull out of the sample will be different in some respect in terms of the distribution of whatever we're trying to measure relative to the population. So that just because of the way in which the variables that we're interested in tend to be distributed. If we were simply going to count the numbers of males and females in a population, and we drew a sample. Uh, if it's 51-49 split, and we draw a sample of a certain size, well, our 
proportion in our sample may be exactly that. It may be slightly different than what the exact distribution is or it may be a little more than slightly different. But almost always the sample, what we measure in the sample, the distribution of the variable in the sample is going to be somewhat different from the population. And what matters for us is that as the size of the sample increases, both the likelihood of differences and the magnitude should decrease. That's the fundamental principle of sampling for us. So when a client says, uh, how big a sample should we have? We ask, uh, how much is your budget and our other three questions? And then we come back with a sample that size that sort of optimizes on those dimensions that are important. Let's go back to the jar of marbles for a minute. We take out one marble, a sample of one. We observe its color, record it, and replace the um, marble. That, because we know there's four colors in there, that's not going to be a very good estimate or confirmation of proportions or anything. So simply put, the sampling problem can be conceived of as how many times will we have to draw out one marble at a time, put it back, before we had some confidence that all of those observations reflected or were close to the actual distribution of the colors of the marbles in the jar. And would it make a difference if we put the marble back and don't mix up the jar? If we do mix up the jar? I mean, those are some considerations that we have to face. If I don't put the, if I got these marbles in this jar and I take one out and I put it back, and I reach in to draw another one, is that going to have an impact on my ability to estimate the proportions? I'm asking you. I'll, this is I'll make this interactive now. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, there's layers and all this kind of stuff. So ideally, we would put the marble back, shake up the jar, and then draw out another one. I had a professor in graduate school whose dissertation research was on the draft lottery, which was not that many years before I entered graduate stool, school. And um, actually, the, rich, the first lottery was somewhat biased. And so he was a social psychologist, and his dissertation was on how people perceived this news when they found out that it was somewhat biased. But they didn't mix the numbers up well enough. Um, I, also, I heard a presentation at some conference on how many times you have to shuffle a deck of cards to really make it random. And it's sort of like seven or more times. So we'd have to shake that jar up quite a bit. <laughs> the mathematical concepts that are um, related to how we determine the sample, what, what we do with sampling, are really probability, permutations, and combinations. And I'll, in all honesty, I didn't ever think about this very much until as I was putting this, at the time I was putting this talk together, I was also helping my son study for his final in 10th uh, grade math. And this was the last unit. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, if you, were to, if you were to take that approach, a relatively cumbersome approach, particularly given our 100 marbles and four colors, you could theoretically come up with all the possible permutations of colors of marbles for samples of different sizes. So what are the permutations for samples of four? What are the permutations for samples of uh, five, six, so on? And you could go through that exercise. Um, what we want is we want to find the value for R, the number of marbles in the subset, that minimizes the differences between the proportions in the sample and those in the jar without costing us an arm and a leg and meet some other requirements. And I don't have a... Um, you know, a way to write, but in effect, that there's a, a curve with diminishing returns. So what we're really trying to do is we're trying to find the value of R on that curve, so the sort of near the point where it starts to level out. Okay, well, there's no, like, surface. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, you all, I'm sure, are familiar with uh, steeply rising curves that then level off because you don't get much extra gain. As you get close to what the proportions in the sample are like, then you have to make the sample much larger to get the next incremental gain. 
Now, fortunately, sampling theory, we have little formulas, rules that we can use. And in our company, there's for proportions, if we're estimating proportions, we've got a little Excel spreadsheet that has a nice user interface on it that we just plug in um, a couple of numbers. And we can plug in the sample size and find out the precision. We can plug in the precision and find out the sample size and so on. We have to specify two parameters in order to generate a sample size for um, our estimate. And those are the degree of precision and the desired probability surrounding that degree of precision. So we sit down with our clients over and over again and say, oh, well, a lot of times all the MBA students come back to us and they say they want a 95% confidence level. And they want plus or minus 5%, because those are the only numbers, the only precision levels, and the only confidence levels that they ever saw throughout their two years of getting an MBA. Um, and so sometimes we come back and suggest, well, maybe 90% confidence is enough. How, I mean, how big is this decision that you're making? And um, in the business world, a lot of times somebody will come to you and they'll say, I want this level, level of precision. And if they actually made a decision at that level of precision with respect to dollars, you know, it would be like a $10 decision. I say, you're making a $100,000 decision. I think you can, you know, expand the range just a little bit. So we have uh, nifty little formulas that we use. And that you may be completely familiar with us. This, so for estimating proportion, I want to, un, uh, just within one single proportion within a sample, use this. This is in our little Excel spreadsheet. And these are the things we're trying to come back to the client and say, here's the sample size, because that drives the cost. And we say, OK, how much error are you willing to accept? Plus or minus 5%. And that's really the, the level of precision relative to the value of the decision for the client. Um, what can you tell me about the population proportion being estimated? Now, if I go back to my market share example, one of the questions we like these uh, job applicants to come up with is, well, what do you know about the market share? Um, that's the one, in my experience, that they're least likely to spontaneously offer. So they've got like two-thirds of the picture. They know precision. They know confidence. They often get budget. But they seldom say, what do you know going in? And the reason that it's important is that if I know that the last time we measured market share it was 10% and my sales have grown a certain amount, I can say, well, it's probably not 50%. Maybe it's between 15 and 20%. Well, if it's between 15 and 20% for the same level of precision, I can get by with a much smaller sample. Mostly, we end up using 50% because that's the worst case for sample size. So we do a lot of 375, 400 interview samples because that's for estimating a proportion plus or minus 5% at a 95% confidence level. Now, I actually have that I got from a place that I used to work a little slide rule, you know, that I just line up the numbers. <laughs> and, um, and on the flip side, it gives me for testing differences in proportions between two independent samples. So it's kind of nifty. A little promotional thing that they used to give out to their clients. Um, just an example. Um, if I wanted this 95% confidence that I, you know, the interpretation that we give to the clients is that if we drew 20 samples, 19 of those samples, the estimate would fall within plus or minus 4 percentage points. We're going to need 600 interviews. OK, and at 25 bucks an interview, that's going to cost that much for data collection. And then there's the 50x multiple for professional time. And <laughs> so this is the basic thing behind all of this calculation. The, the, the assumption that if we drew a lot of identical samples of size r, back to that you know, picking the permutation size, subset size, that's going to be most likely to minimize the, the difference. We want to come very close to the actual distribution within the population. And all the statistics we use are based on these sampling distributions, the t-tests and things like that, for, for these um, estimates. So if we went back to the jar of marbles, we take 10 marbles at a time. 
these are the pair mutations that would be closest. There was, I think there was 32 red marbles, so three red marbles, one or two black marbles, two or three, those, those sets of pair mutations would come closest. And the question is, how many times, how many samples of 10 would we have to draw in order to uh, approximate that in the distribution, the sampling distribution? How many of you uh, remember uh, the Crest commercials that said nine out of 10, or not, you know, a certain number of kids had fewer cavities? Um, what Procter & Gamble did was that they did multiple tests of 10 subjects at a time. And finally, they hit, a one, hit upon one where they had a really decent proportion of kids who had fewer cavities. And they reported that. Their sample was really, <laughs> their sample was really like a thousand cases because they did these little replicates of 10 and they should have combined them because it was pretty much all the same thing. But some smart person at Procter & Gamble capitalized on sampling error until they came up with something that they claim, could claim in advertising that crest, you know, 57% fewer cavities or whatever, whatever the uh, measure was. This was, I was really young when this was on. <laughs> so. Um, so we go through all of this kind of stuff, calculating the probability of including it in a given sample size. This is all what's behind what we do. And most people that I work with don't understand how this makes a difference. You know, if I were, if I were trying to teach somebody what sampling was about, this is the kind of example I would use. In fact, I have tried to do it with fifth graders because my kid's fifth grade teacher likes to take them around to interesting places and they came to Gordon Black and we demonstrated how we interview and I did a little demonstration on sampling and I used this cereal called triples and I said, okay, we're going to estimate how many rice, how many wheat, how many corn in triples and gave them all little cups of triples and they had to count them and we did some things with them. But the idea that you know each little cup has a different set and some, I, some things like that. And then they got to eat the triples, so they were happy. <laughs> <laughs> that was my wife's idea, you know, food work. <laughs> Whatever you do with the demonstration, give them something they can eat. Um, I've, I've, gone, I've done all this exercise, and it took me all of about two minutes in my little Excel spreadsheet or with my little slide rule. And I've come back to the client and said, here's how many interviews we should conduct for you to meet your requirements. Now I have to somehow get those people. It's, we're almost always dealing with people, once in a while with events. All of this theory is based on the assumption that we drew this sample randomly from the population. And in survey research, there are lots of different techniques, little practical techniques, for getting a random sample. And in fact, they almost always are never completely random sample. And one reason for that is that uh, not everybody is willing to participate. So how many of you have been <coughs> surveyed by telephone in the last month, received a call that was a telephone survey? How many of you participated in that survey? <laughs> So we have relatively high non-response. Um, the, computer the computerized ones were, please hold for a survey question, you know, a lot of people hang up on. Um, mail surveys where if we had a list of names and addresses and we mailed them out, you can get anywhere from like 5 to 30 percent response rate, which means that not, uh, 95 down to 70 percent did not respond. And that your identification of those individuals may have been random, but your sample is no longer a, necessarily a random sample of those individuals. So sometimes people ignore that and apply the statistics anyway. Um, but those statistics are based for the most part on random, a theory of random sampling. And when we dial telephone numbers, quite often, we generate those numbers through a random process. And the way that works is there are companies who actually do this and provide us with sets that we work off of. 
but they have worked with the telephone companies to understand what are the working blocks of numbers. So that would be like 272, 8,000, 272, 9,000 through, through uh, 9,999 and so on. And then they, they have algorithms which generate the last three digits within those and, and randomly and sometimes they use auto dialers to test and eliminate non-working numbers. So there's a, an industry and there are four or five companies that exist ex entirely on generating telephone samples, numbers for us to call. Um, there are lots of variations to simple proportional sampling. Seldom in marketing research do we, we, do we go out and do a random sample of households. Where that often happens is in opinion polling and Gordon Black Corporation used to do a lot of editorial polling for USA Today. When USA Today started because the Gannett Corporation is headquartered in Rochester and they were kind of launching USA Today out of Rochester, they had a relationship with Gordon Black to collect, to do surveys. So we do surveys about late breaking news. If some event happened in the news, um, we would conduct a survey in the afternoon and deliver the results by 9.30 in the evening and USA Today would have um, the opinions of the public in the paper the next morning. So the Gulf War would be an example where we initiate this activity and USA Today calls us and says, okay, we want a poll to see how many Americans are in favor of this. Well, we would do a simple random sample of households. We would ask to speak to an adult. And that's as close as most marketing research comes to true proportional sampling. Much more often, there are various groups of people that we're interested in, like people who buy ready-to-drink fruit juices. Um, and we might want people who buy subsets of people who buy um, concentrates versus jarred juices. So, or, you know, cranberry juice in a jar versus frozen orange juice in the concentrate. And so we may have non-proportional sampling. We may have stratified sampling. We may have cluster sampling where we've got lots of different units of things like um, say departments in companies. We do major surveys for businesses and we're looking for decision makers but the decision makers are in different departments. So we randomly sample departments and then find individuals within the departments. Uh, but often those proportions in the sample then don't represent the proportions in the real world. And we typically know something about those proportions ahead of time. These are the applications that we use often in survey research where sampling is important. We want to estimate a proportion. We want to compare proportions from two groups, either in time, what was it last year, what is it now? Um, or this group of customers versus our competitors' customers. We also do a lot where we estimate means or we compare means between two or more groups. So those are typical problems. A case example. I had a client who wanted to determine the extent to which its customers were aware of a change in the name of the company following a merger. Um, there's a company, it's, it's now called Paramount Parks. It was called King's Entertainment. They own five theme parks around the country. Paramount Motion Pictures bought King's Entertainment and changed the names of the parks. So the parks, um, I don't know, you may be familiar with some of them. There's a park named Carowinds in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, King's Island in Cincinnati. King's Dominion in Virginia. Uh, Great America in San Jose or Santa Clara, California and one in Canada. And they all became Paramount's Carowinds, Paramount's Kings Island, so on. And they launched an advertising campaign. So they came to us, we were doing some other work for them in the first place, and said, we want to understand how this is impacting perceptions in the marketplace, how this changed, how many people are aware of it. Um, do they think we're the same park, or do they think we're different? We did three waves. So we did a wave before the advertising started, we did a wave immediately after the advertising ran, and then we did a wave sort of towards the end of the park season. So we've got, say, March or January, January, May, and September. 
as waves in the survey. So one thing that we're going to do is we're going to compare wave one to wave two to wave three. We've got three independent samples. In a lot of market research studies, um, we wanted a particular we want a particular type of individual, somebody who uses a product, somebody who would make a decision. If we're studying telecommunications and households long distance, we say, could I please speak to the person who's involved in decisions about which long distance company your household would use? No, this is not a sales call, nor will a sales call result. <laughs> um, you, can, you can tell the difference between a survey now and a sales call because our interviewers never ask you, how are you doing? <laughs> or how are you today? <laughs> to which you should reply, up to now, just fine. <laughs> the target person we wanted was somebody who was in the market for theme parks. That would be somebody who had visited a theme park or, or said they would be likely to visit a theme park in the near future. And we set ranges around these things because um, again, now we're dealing in another cost issue. We know what the sample size should be, but the probability of reaching a person when we call into a household is another driver of the cost. It's how many calls do I have to make into a random sample of households to get that one person who will qualify to be in the study. In this particular case, and this may apply to lots of survey research, not only do we have to get a household where somebody qualifies, somebody had visited or would visit a theme park, but we also had to deal with the fact that there could be multiple qualified people in the household. So there could be more than one person who would visit or had visited a theme park in a particular household. In fact, it's very likely that we would have multiples. And we wanted to make the results meaningful from an expenditure standpoint, so we only interviewed people who were 15 years of age or older. People who could reasonably make the decision to go to the theme park kind of on their own. In the household, what we did, and this is typical, is we, when we got somebody on the phone, we said, please give me the ages of all the people over 15 in the household. And then our computer, we use a computer interviewing system, our computer randomly selected one of those people. So that told us how many people there were in the household between the ages of 15 and 55, I think we used. And then we randomly selected one and said, could I please speak to that person? We ended up, because we wanted that plus or, fi plus or minus five percentage points for estimates of 50% at the 95% confidence interval with a sample, a random sample of 380 people for each one of those parks. So there were five. We only did this for four of the parks. There were four parks that we included. Um, and we had 380 of these random interviews for each of those parks. Um, I've already talked about this two-stage sampling procedure. But the sampling frame where we started, the list of telephone numbers was generated from um, households in the market areas for the theme parks. And the way in which we generated this list was actually the park did a survey of people who come into the park. And among other things they asked them is, what's your zip code? So we got the distribution of zip codes and drew a proportional sample of telephone numbers by zip code. So occasionally we would call somebody for a park in Cincinnati that lived in California because there was some market traffic between those areas or things like that, or Cincinnati for Charlotte and so on. Oops, back, back, back. Oh. This is an example of the kind of results that we got, that we were looking for in the comparison. So unaided awareness of the new name for each park. We ask the person in the study on the phone, can you tell me the name of a theme park? Um, or please name a theme park without giving them any prompting. And this 1% up there for PKD, which is one of the parks, is the percentage of people in the first wave who correctly said Paramount's King's Dominion. 
A bunch of people said King's Dominion. But this is the correct, the new name. You can see that we're now comparing, and it goes up considerably in the second wave for most of these parks. And it continues to go up, for the most part, in the third wave. So there was some name building. Now, for, for Procter & Gamble, Procter & Gamble had a standard anytime they launched a new product that 80% of the population had to be aware of the brand name within eight weeks of the launch. You have to spend a ton of money on television advertising and drop a bunch of coupons to achieve that. Paramount Parks didn't spend that kind of money. And moreover, from a psychological standpoint, which is the kind of things that we deal with, the change was not very significant. It was putting another word in front of the park name and everybody's still saying, let's go to Carowinds. I mean, they're not saying, let's go to Paramount's Carowinds. Another thing that we do is we look at relationships in the data. And in this case, we simply looked at some categorical relationships, some cross tabulations. But this is breaking out people who, in the, su in the survey, after we'd asked them to name the parks without any prompting, we then asked them if they'd seen or heard any advertising for the park. And those who said they had seen or heard advertising were more likely to give the correct name than those who, who didn't. So this is getting farther into the data. And this is another consideration in sample size. The more you're going to break the data into subgroups, the larger the sample has to be. So we go back to the client and say, well, fine, you want to do this, but you're going to need to spend a little more money. The sampling theory that we use to draw the sample allows us to test hypotheses about the differences between the waves and the differences between those who saw advertising and those who hadn't seen advertising. And we use tests like chi-square or t-tests or simple binomial tests, depending on what the actual um, data is that we're looking at. And the question, was simple inferential statistics question, are the differences that we see real or are they due to sampling error? So that's why we've gone to the client and said, you need to do this many interviews in the first place. My transmitter's falling off here. So. There was a little twist in this study, and I'm going to describe that in a minute. Um, complex samples are samples that are anything other than simple, in my, in my world, or anything other than simple proportional random samples, simple probability samples. Um, they can be what we call non-proportional samples with quotas, where we want to get at least 100 people in a particular group. They can be stratified non-proportional samples, where you know that the, the population is organized in a particular way, and so you can use that information to increase the efficiency of the sample. Or they can be cluster samples, where the population is organized into distinct, distinct physical units, and you can identify those units and sample them, and then, like, you know, if you wanted to do study on schools, you could sample schools, or you could sample classrooms, and then do random samples within those units, and so on. Random sample of schools, random sample of classrooms, interview every kid in the class, those kinds of things. Um, when we do this, we usually have to do something to correct back to the population when we're, est when we're talking about the population. When we're talking about the subgroup, we don't have to apply weighting to the subgroup. But when we're talking about the overall population, we then have to weight the different non-proportional aspects of the sample to reflect the population. In this study, we had a supplemental sample. Those people who were interviewed coming into the park, well, a bunch of them also were asked for their phone numbers. And so we called those people as well. So that's a supplemental sample that we, it was a random sample of those individuals. But when we were talking about some of the issues, like how many people had visited a the park, then we would overestimate for a marketplace how many people had visited a park if we included those or just added them in. So we got an extra 100 households. And as a result of this, people who had visited the park are overrepresented relative to what they should have been in the population. Um, this is an example. I mean, let's just show some of the data. In the population, the proportion in the sample, we had 79% of that total, 378 plus 100, 
that were random and 21% with a supplemental sample. If we adjusted our overall samples to get the right incidence of people who visited a park, then this is what the expected proportion should look like. 87% random and 13% on this additional sample. So we apply a weight factor. We basically discount the voice of every one of those 100 people in the supplemental sample and say they only represent this many people in the real world instead of this many people in the real world. And those are the kinds of things that we have to go through. A lot of it is we use programs like SPSS and SAS to do this. Things like, you know, they're similar to Minitab, but we sometimes do this in Excel spreadsheets. We sometimes do it on hand calculators. Whatever's handy and fastest, usually. <laughs> the reasons we do this are to correct for, <laughs> for, I could fix that right now, actually. <laughs> for non-equal probability sampling, for non-response, non that's not for random non-response. Um, correct for non-proportional probability sampling. Non-equal probability sampling, the Gordon Black Company has made sort of a name for itself in what we call central location sampling. We used to do a big study for the Partnership for Drug-Free America, and we did this in shopping malls. And one of the things that happens if you interview people in shopping malls, which a lot of market research is, is that people who visit the malls more frequently have a greater likelihood of being included in the survey. So correcting for non-equal probability sampling is getting the information that allows you to discount or enhance a particular person's um, voice in the sample because you, you know that their probability of being included was either greater or less than somebody else. So typically what you do here is you ask people how many times in the last month have, or, or over the data collection period have they visited the mall and you use that to create a weight. Oops. Oh, shoot. Oh, I, I had conclusions up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the clu conclusions were that, uh, let me look at the last page here and I'll just state them. Sampling is critical to the success of survey research. <laughs> 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 Number one conclusion. Um, sampling theory is based on s you know, what may be relatively simple ideas of probability, permutations, combinations. It, it, you know, it goes back to something as uh, fundamental as that. And finally, statistical tests assume that we got that sample in some kind of random fashion. And those are, the, those are kind of the critical conclusions that I would want to communicate to somebody who's going to embark on trying to do a survey in the real world. Um, so let me blank this out. And uh, time for questions. OK, thank you. Well, the incidence in that particular study of qualified people was 55%. Now, we, in survey research, you have a number of things happen. You have people who never answer the phone. You have people who hang up on you. They're called refusals. Um, <laughs> we also have names for all of these things. <laughs> Uh, one of the best that I encountered was, was respondent no longer available permanently. It was uh, RN Lap or something, and as in deceased, um, <laughs> which works when you have a list and you're trying to get a particular individual. And sometimes, you know, those are things that happen. You don't think about them in statistics class or research methods class, that you could be calling up to ask for a particular person who's listed as a telephone subscriber and that person has died. And it does happen. Today. Yes, yes. <laughs> or last week. <laughs> uh, and so your interviewer better be able to say, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, so we had to, to get that 378, we had to, uh, con c we had to talk to a, about a little over 600 households. But we had to call maybe, um, we had to dial maybe 2,000 different numbers. 
Um, I, I was going to guess five times as many. Yeah, you know, we when we we ask when we order numbers or we ask clients who are going to give us lists, we usually use a four or five to one ratio for telephone numbers. Yeah. Now how, how would you correct for these non-responders? Who people just don't like answering the surveys. How do you correct for that when you do your analysis for the company? Can you say like 1% of people who answer the phone or are willing to participate in these surveys recognize your name? Or um, you can't really say 1% of all people. There are a number of ways, a number of strategies um, that are used with, I don't want to say with varying degrees of success, but with varying effort. So one thing that you can do is that you can keep, we keep track of the disposition of every number. So we know how many are non-working numbers and things like that. So we can, we can say what proportion of the response, non-response is random non-response or sort of not likely to introduce a bias. So if the phone's disconnected and things like that. Um, and then there are things that, like we keep track of the people who are not qualified that we talk to. And in the refusals, we can do things like we can look at it by region of the country. We can sometimes, uh, when we do election surveys, what we do is we attempt to do refusal conversions. And the reason for that is that when you're doing pre-election polling, the people who refuse to participate initially are not necessarily a random set of the population. And, and so we give those numbers to a uh, more skilled interviewer and call them back and attempt to convert them to a complete. And you can convert a certain number of those. It's also possible to do non-response surveys. So for example, if you did a mail survey, a typical approach is to then take, you mail out to 10,000 people and you get 2,000 surveys back. Then you do a survey of 200 of the 8,000, a telephone survey of 200 of the 8,000 who didn't respond, and you collect information that's critical to matching the, to just seeing if they're different or not from the, the people who returned. Now, in some cases, you get very different kinds of answers from mail and from telephone. When you do customer satisfaction surveys, which is a lot of our work, in mail surveys, you tend to get lower satisfaction ratings than in telephone surveys. And one reason for that is that people who are motivated enough to return the survey in a mail, if it comes in the mail, usually are more likely to have something they want to complain about. So there are a number of strategies that are employed. Some of them are more or less effective. And uh, there are some different techniques done with things like jackknifing and bootstrapping and replicate samples and a lot of, it depends on really how much time and money and, and how much you want to play around what you can try to do. But at, at a fundamental level, the best thing is to try and understand what's behind the non-response and make estimates. I often say to a client, um, okay, we made this estimate based on 50% of your customer, uh, you know, 50% of the people we wanted to talk to. How far off could we be? If everybody who didn't answer the survey responded in this way, at the extremes of a measure, for example. So let's say I'm, I'm asking people, would they buy a particular product? And only 50% of the starting sample actually completes the survey. So I say, I put limits around it. I say, what if everybody who did not answer the survey said they would not buy the product? What does that mean for the demand? So those are some estimation approaches that just, they're, they're pragmatic. And we tend to be a little creative about trying to deal with non-response whenever we can. But it's a major problem. Another question? Angel, um, do you write uh, up the questions yourselves, or does the client participate in writing the questions, or do you write the questions by? Because if you're in a survey, the questions can be stacked a certain way. Do right? you try to stack it a certain way on purpose, or, or not, or? True confessions is after <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, well, yesterday at, um, in our office, I just did a, uh, we do these brown bag lunches where there are training sessions. And I did one on uh, 
questionnaire design. And there are lots of, there's a lot of empirical, a number of empirical studies on the consequences of, of putting general questions after specific questions or vice versa on wording changes. Um, I'll give you an example that was in, that's in a book on questions that I used in this um, talk yesterday. Uh, a group, two groups of people were shown movies, the same movies of car crashes, car accidents, the kind of things you'd see in driver's education to make you understand how serious driving is. And then they were given a survey and they were asked um, how fast were the cars going at the time of the crash. But one group was received a question that said how fast were the cars going when they contacted each other. The other group was asked how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other. And um, the mean speed for the contacted group was about 32 miles an hour and it was